2 Corinthians chapter 5 at verse 16 following. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. And that's enough to get us started. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Christ become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our redeemer. Amen. From now on, something has happened. And what Paul is referencing here is the cross and all that happens because of the cross. Paul would be one that says that it was Christ and the cross that splits time. Um, it's not the birth of Christ that causes the difference between BC and AD, it's the cross. And from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, that is according to human standards. If you back up, what he's been doing is he's been defending his apostleship. Others have attacked him. You're not a real apostle. You, you know, you, you weren't there. And, uh, uh, and so now uh, Paul takes the offense and he says, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. He has been regarded according to the flesh and he's using their standard now against them. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. Well, when was that? Well, that was pre-conversion. Remember when Paul was converted, he was persecuting Christians. He was one that, that uh, was actively seeking out and uh, seeking to destroy this heresy. What was the curse? Well, back in Deuteronomy, and I've got this passage marked, so unless you're a Baptist, you're not going to get there in time. Just let me read it to you. Deuteronomy 21, at verse 22. And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, verse 23, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day. For a hang man, hanged man is cursed by God. A hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. So this cursed man can actually defile the land if he's left overnight. Now, Paul references that in Galatians. And again, I've got that passage marked. Galatians 3 and 13. Wrong page, Earl. Verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ, the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. This is the idea of the atonement. How does the death of Christ make peace with us towards God, the Father. He becomes a curse. Why is he cursed? He's hung on the tree. That's the cross. And uh, we're going to hear more about the atonement later in this same passage. But just understand that, that from now on, no longer does, does Paul uh, judge based on the flesh because of the cross event. He once judged Christ himself. In other words, he considered Christ, Jesus, a false messiah. There were other false messiahs in, uh, in those days. There, was, there were several. And, and Paul considered this Jesus of Nazareth one of, of several. And he, he says, I used to be like you guys. I, I used to judge according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Why? He got, he got, Paul got saved. He found out that Jesus wasn't the false Messiah after all. He was the true and the living Messiah. And there was a purpose to the curse. And the purpose was to remove the curse or actually to take it on our account from us. And it's on him. 
we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, what's the therefore? Therefore, no longer. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, because we regard him thus no longer, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Now, I need to camp out there for a while. Notice it doesn't say he is a new creature. Look at your text. It doesn't say new creature, does it? It says new creation. Genesis chapter 1 and 2, the creation story is being redone. Every time someone comes to Christ, there's a new creation. There's there's this image of the Genesis 1-2 creation story reenacting in every individual. And it's something that in a few moments, Paul will say he's now charged with passing on. We're contagious. As Christians, we not only receive the benefit, we're contagious so that others can catch Jesus from us and become in themselves, the new creation. Now, I hope this imagery is going to be helpful. I used to be a, a, a Star Trek fan. And uh, recently I found on uh, uh, Paramount Plus uh, a, a, a new edition of Star Trek um, uh, where it's got Jean-Luc Picard and the name of it's Picard. And one of the things that happens is you see a, a flashback to the enemy that was the Borg. And the thing about the Borg was they assimilated whatever they came across. And their big word was, we are the Borg, you will be assimilated. And, and, and so whatever manner of being they would come across would become uh, part of the Borg and, and they would be made Borg. But they would still look like them, themselves with just a few added parts. That's the image that comes to my mind that might best sort of describe. We still look like we did before Christ. But, but in us is, is an outpost of the new creation. This Genesis 1-2 event way back is being reenacted in us and we're contagious with it. This is the equivalent. Now y'all know that one of my favorite passages is, is Revelation 21, the, the New Jerusalem. This is Paul, the new creation is Paul's understanding of what John talks about. When John talks about, you know, behold I, John, saw the New Jerusalem come down out of heaven from God and, and the dwelling of God is with man and he shall be our God and we shall be his people and there should, you know, behold, all things are made new. This is that from Paul's viewpoint. It's the new creation and it, it, it takes place at salvation. Yes, it, it happens on an individual basis, but we're not left just individualistically. We're part of the collective new creation. And everywhere a Christian is, is an outpost of the new creation. And um, I like the way one of our bishops talked about evangelism, that evangelism is God taking back what belongs to God, even if it kills him. Um, this is God taking back what belongs to God. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that in Christ, we're incorporated, we're assimilated, we're, we're uh, uh, new creation. If anyone is in Christ, yes, that happens on an individual basis, but we're not left as individuals. We're left connected uh, in Christ, incorporated, but also joined with each other. In Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That's that image of Genesis 1-2, uh, 
and other places being reenacted. It's 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 just it's 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 all new. All this is from God. And so you have God taking the initiative. The Father has taken the initiative. This was always the plan. This was not plan B. This was not something that was added because the Old Testament failed. You have streams from the Old Testament coming together to help us understand what Christ has done on the cross. And, and, and the Father took the initiative. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. So there you have the atonement theory. It's through Christ. We're in Christ. Again, incorporated and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. All right, there's the contagious part that I was talking about. Not only are we saved, not only are we reconciled, you might not have known you were enemies with God, but everyone outside of Christ is in open rebellion to God because it's God's will that we receive Christ. And so now we're no longer in rebellion, we're reconciled. That's the first step or first stage. The, the second step or second stage is that we're now given this ministry. We become ministers of reconciliation. This us is Paul and it's his team, but it's also everybody who is in Christ. Uh, this is a point that, that I want heard. It's not just the clergy that do ministry. It's, it's every Christian. If you want me to uh, minister on your behalf, does that mean I get to go to heaven on your behalf mm -hmm. and, and leave you behind? I mean, this is our ministry. There is a specialized component, the clergy, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and B, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Notice it's the world being reconciled. It's not just an individual. We in America are so very individualistic, but all of creation is being reconciled. Yes, one at a time. But then the one who is reconciled becomes a reconciler. Not counting their trespasses against them. In other words, it's not judgment day yet. At some point in the future, trespasses will be counted that, you know, there'll be a judgment day and everybody will stand in judgment. But that day's not yet. Why? Because we're in the time of reconciliation not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Again, Paul is justifying his being an apostle. And his proof as, of his apostleship is the idea that he's a contagious Christian, that he is in fact offering Christ to everyone he can in, uh, in Timothy, I think it's in 2 Timothy, he's talking about going home. And he says, uh, not only to us, but to all who uh, look forward to his appearing. What he's doing there, he's giving an altar call to Timothy. Paul is so dedicated to offering Christ that his own son in the faith hears him give another altar call. It is so very strange. He just can't help himself making his appeal through us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. All right, pause here. Who did Paul write this letter to? Corinth. To the church. He's giving an altar call to the church. <laughs> Sometimes the church needs an altar call. <laughs> Be reconciled to God. I mean, he's saying that to the to supposedly saved people. Maybe they're not as uh, 
contagious as they need to be. Maybe they need to understand that uh, if you really do belong, you can't help yourself. And if you can help yourself, maybe you're not as far along in Christ as you thought you were. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake. Now, 21 is sort of the culmination of how he understands Jesus making peace between you and I and God. This is the atonement theory. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Now, over in Isaiah, in the suffering servant passage of Isaiah, Isaiah 53, 9, he, for he did no lawlessness. It's talking about the suffering servant, and most Christians understand the suffering servant as being the image of the Christ. For he did no lawlessness. Now this passage, he made him who knew no sin be sin. There's the image of being on the tree hung. Cursed is he hung on a tree. So that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. There it is. The curse is lifted off us. The curse is on the Christ. He's hanging on the tree. But he's not left overnight because if he was, he would uh, curse the land that God gave. It's interesting that you'll notice that Jesus didn't stay on the, the cross overnight. All this is, is prophecy that was fulfilled in Jesus. And you have salvation because he... Now, when you hear the word atonement, hear, break it down as at one meant. We're at the state of being one with God. And the atonement is the state of our being one with God because of what Christ has done and our accepting of that, our receiving of that, our becoming contagious with that. And that's my understanding of this passage. What are your thoughts? Well, Father, I don't have the judgment. Um, is that just for our offenses after our representation? There's two judgments. One is the great white throne judgment that those outside of Christ will face. The judgment that you and I face is talked about in 1 Corinthians 3, but there's no foundation laid other than that which is laid in Christ Jesus. But then it goes on and talks about what you build on that foundation will be revealed in the day, and that's the day of Christ. Whether it be gold, silver, precious stone, that is, that which is eternal, or wood, hay, stubble, the day will reveal it as though fire, as through fire. And, and basically what's being said is what will be judged is not our salvation, but what we do with Christ. And it says, you know, if it burns up, we ourselves will survive even though as through fire. So, you know, even if you don't do anything with Christ, because we're not saved by works, we're saved by faith. If you don't do anything with Christ, even if you believe, you still make it to heaven. You just don't have any reward with you, gold, silver, precious stone. That is that which is eternal. Um, What's that song that talks about we'll lay our crowns, cast our crowns before him and wonder, love, and praise? You know, what do we do with, with the reward? We offer it to God as thanksgiving. Not as payment, but as thanksgiving, as, as a, a blessing to God. Our, our deepest desire as we grow in Christ is to be a blessing to God through Christ Jesus. I hope that was of help. <clears throat> but again, uh, we we face two different judgments. The the lost face what is referred to in Revelation, I believe it's twenty, 
as the great white throne judgment. And that's one we don't want to go through and don't really want our worst enemy to go through. There's nobody you could hate bad enough that you would want them to go through the great white throne judgment. Now, would that judgment you just talked about for believers, would that be the sheep and the goats? No, that's from Matthew tw uh, 25 around, <clears throat> oh, well, 40 is uh, where it says, uh, uh, for as you did to the least of these, my brothers, yeah. you did unto me. Yeah. But uh, uh, let's just flip over to 1 Corinthians 3 and read that passage. Uh, verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. He's talking about uh, Apollos, the division in the church. I laid a foundation, someone else is building upon it. Let each take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work has, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire, verses 10 through 15. You could go on, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? And, and anyway, you, you go on to a good theology of the church and, and, and individual believers. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Between when we go to heaven, between those that are saved. That's what happens at the great white throne. Okay. And, and all of us appear, and that's where uh, we heard that reference to Matthew 25, the separation of the sheep and the goats, where there will be a, a time of separation. I, I'm told that uh, this is apocalyptic or uh, it, it's, it's hearsay, but... Uh, that if you refuse to make a decision and you sit on the fence between the sheep and the goats, the devil still gets you because he owns the fence. <laughs> That's the story one preacher told. He said, you know, fellow refused to make a decision. He sat on the fence in between. And finally the devil comes up to him and says, come on, come on, go on with me. But I, I didn't make a decision. He said, I own the fence. You know, to not decide is to decide. Bless God for the struggle. Bless God for the struggle to love the unlovable. I love this little verse. I looked it up. Um, I could remember one line of it, but I couldn't remember the rest. It says, it's that the title is outwitted. It says, he drew a circle that shut me out. Heretics, rebel, the things of love. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle and took the hint. Amen. And I fully understand the difficulty to love the man in Russia, but uh, Jesus died for him. Yeah. Carolyn said to us the other day, we saw about praying for the people in Ukraine. Carol said, do we ever pray for Putin, you know, for the Russians? Well, I've caught myself praying for the Christians in Russia because I know they're in a different, a difficult place. But quite honestly, y'all are now holding me accountable because I had not, it had not crossed my feeble mind to pray for Putin. Maybe we need to close out with prayer for him. Father, we do ask your blessing on Mr. Putin, the president of Russia. In whatever way you would work it, we ask you to bring him to salvation, help him to repent, uh, prevent war continuing. We ask in the name of the Christ, Amen. Amen. Um, it's dangerous trying to pray someone else's behavior because it strays into witchcraft. If I say, you know, uh, stop Mr. Putin from war. I can't do that. That's witchcraft. I can pray stop war because God can work 
in ways beyond me, but to control an individual would be to remove free will from that person. And, and that becomes witchcraft. Any other thoughts? Bob, I know what version, I'm sorry. Go what ahead. Version Bible do you have? This is the, <laughs> I believe it's the English Standard Version, the ESV. I go through different. You ought to see the stack of Bibles I've got. I've got, because all of them are translations. You know, I, I don't do the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic, so I've got to depend on translations and dictionaries. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Now send us from this place as the new creation in Jesus. Amen.